All right, let's get started. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the first talk of the 2014-2015 STS Speaker Series, uh, Environmental History and Sustainability. Uh, I thought that this was a, well, it turned out to be a very uh, uh, a good topic to have at this time. Uh, for several reasons, we have a, uh, in the history department, a new environmental historian, Dr. Catherine Meyer, who you'll be uh, talking to uh, more intimately in a moment, uh, uh, for one thing. Uh, for the other thing is that for those of you who are interested in sustainability, regardless of what your major is, there is a new certificate of sustainability, which is coming online, I think, this semester. Um, if you are interested in that, uh, you'll need to, the, the, the main person to talk to is Dr. Clifford Fox in Environmental Studies. Uh, so if you're interested in issues of sustainability, and again, regardless of what your major is, um, please talk to Dr. Fox. Um, uh, in terms of our speaker series, uh, I would like to thank the College of Humanities and Sciences, uh, Dean James Coleman and Allison Baskey, whose continued support for the SDS program uh, makes events like this possible. Uh, we also like to thank the VCU Department of History, uh, especially its chair, uh, John Kneebone, uh, as well as its outstanding faculty for their continued support of what we do here. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the STS Administrative Assistant, Ms. Wanda Clary, uh, who frankly does most of the heavy lifting around here. She uh, uh, arranges rooms and sorts out travel arrangements and keeps straight the dozens of little details that make an event like this possible. So uh, a big heartfelt thanks to her. Um, I just have a couple of minor events before we, or minor announcements before we get to our major uh, event here today. Uh, we have another uh, STS event coming up on November 18th at 3.30 in this very room. Dr. Lisa Sedaris, who is a professor of religious studies at Indiana University, is giving a talk called Contested Wonder, Environmental Ethics, and the New Cosmology. If you are interested in what this talk is about or anything else about the SDS program, I invite all of you to, let me flip the thing, uh, to take a look at our website uh, or our Facebook page or uh, we also have a Twitter account. We are so technologically uh, uh, adept in the STS department. Um, check us out uh, and you'll get all sorts of information about upcoming events and other STS related uh, uh, stuff going on here at the VCU campus. Okay, without further ado then, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Catherine Meyer who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. It's my happy duty to um, introduce to you Dr. Edmund P. Russell, who is currently Joyce and Elizabeth Hall Distinguished Professor of U.S. History at University of Kansas. Um, he received his PhD in biology from the University of Michigan. He has held previous teaching appointments at University of Virginia and American. Um, he is the recipient of numerous awards and honors for his teaching and his scholarship. And on a personal note, I've been the recipient of many of his um, mentorship on these areas. Um, he is incoming vice president of research um, for the American Historical Association. He served in the past as distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Uh, he has won the Edelston Prize for his book, War and Nature, fighting humans, in, humans and insects with chemicals from World War I to Silent Spring. Um, he has many, many other publications. I'll just mention a few more um, for your reading list for the summer. Evolutionary History, Uniting History and Biology to Understand Life on Earth, and currently under contract with Cambridge University. Uh, he has his newest book, Fast Dogs and Englishmen, How Greyhounds and Whippets Co-Evolved with English People from 1500 to 1900. And I could go on and on about the quality and volume of Dr. Russell's scholarship, but you'll see for yourself in a moment why he is so deeply admired in the field of environmental history. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Russell.
Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Meyer. Thank you to VCU and especially the STS program for having me here. Can the people in the back row hear me all right without a microphone? Okay, good. If you ever can't, raise your hand, please, and let me know. My understanding is that this audience is varied, that we have undergraduates from a variety of fields, graduate students, uh, and faculty from a number of fields. So I have created a talk that's pitched towards a general audience. If you want more depth on any of these, I'll be happy to do that in the question and answer uh, period. So my topic today is coevolutionary history. And to develop that idea, I want to start with, is it OK if we maybe swing this shut? with a, a scene from Wales in 1797 that is utterly ordinary. This is an inn in Wales. Uh, you can see that there are some tables here, uh, some people eating, there's a cat uh, right here, somebody serving the food. It's a very ordinary sort of scene. Uh, and then you have a cook sitting right here looking at a spit of uh, metal here on which is a piece of meat that is rotating in front of this open fire. Now if you trace this um, spit, it's attached to a pulley on this end and you can barely see some cords that go up like this. They go up uh, to this wheel here that's kind of like a big hamster wheel and inside is a dog right here. This is a dog. This appears to be a ham and the poor dog is like Sisyphus walking day uh, for hours trying to reach this ham and never getting there. But as the dog walks it turns the axle of the wheel which is connected by this line to uh, this wheel and turns the the meat in front of the fire. So uh, this is this dog was a, a type of dog, a breed called a turn spit because that's what its job was, to turn spits of meat. And they were actually very common. Uh, their dog wheels were, were very common. Um, the city of Bath, for example, in the 18th century was home to an estimated 2,000 turn spits. 2,000 turn spits. And I show this scene um, for a variety of reasons to set the stage for my talk. Uh, one of which is that it helps me introduce the idea uh, this is the agenda that I'm going to cover, the idea of environmental history as a field. That's in the title of the speaker series, so I'll talk a bit about it, it a, a, a bit about it. But let me set the stage. Environmental history is a field of history. All historians are interested in how people interact with other people over time. Environmental historians do that too. But in addition, environmental historians are interested in how people interact with the rest of nature, the rest of the world. So how have people interacted with nature over time is the subject of environmental history. After I talk about that, I want to talk about coevolutionary history in particular, which is a, an approach to environmental history, but also history of technology. And then most of the talk I'll devote to developing my thesis for the talk, which is that coevolution has been an important uh, and common process in history. So let me return to this image and ex uh, explain these ideas. So first of all, the environmental history side of things. This scene depends on having a, an animal that turns this meat. So that's not a fully human sort of creature, but also not a fully wild one. It's a middle ground. And that's, um, the, that middle ground is the kind of thing environmental historians are very interested in. From a history of technology point of view, this is a, a common way to power machinery before the 20th century. Until the mid-20th century, most power uh, that human beings used was animal power. And one of my arguments is that when people took wild animals and modified them to be domestic organisms that did work for people, they converted them into tools. And all tools are technology, so these are living technologies. In other words, biotechnologies. Uh, so that, that's how history of technology fits in here. This animal is an integral part of this technological system. So let's move on then to environmental history. So I said that it's the, the field that looks at the interaction between people and the rest of nature. And 
I am especially interested in reciprocal impacts over time. So looking at how people, uh, there's an arrow here that's hard to see, uh, affected the environment, how that circles back to reshape human life over time. So the central idea of environmental history then is that history is not simply the by byproduct of human-human interactions. It is that but it's also the, a byproduct of interactions between people and everything else in the earth. So here's um, an example of environmental history. This is uh, uh, a picture, two pictures for, of elephants in Africa. Now, this one has tusks, this one does not. Uh, historically, basically all African elephants had tusks. It, less than one in a thousand was tuskless. Uh, and, and this is a genetic trait. This uh, tusklessness is a genetic trait. It's not a matter of this elephant having had the tusks sawn off. Um, so at one time, basically all African elephants looked like this. In some populations today, 30% of elephants look like this. So it's, it's a big change over time. Why might that be? Yes, sir? Poaching, Poaching exactly right. So this is, this is the reason. Because people like to create art out of ivory, such as chess pieces, uh, poachers go out and kill elephants uh, for their ivory tusks. The poachers are interested only in the ivory, so they usually um, kill the elephant, cut off the tusks, and leave the rest of the carcass to rot. Uh, other things that ivory's been used for over time were billiard balls and piano keys. That's where we get the phrase, tickling the ivory for playing the piano. So here we have an impact of, of people on another species. And this is an example of evolution. Now, because people are from a variety of backgrounds, a quick reminder on what evolution means. The, the definition of evolution is change in the frequency of inherited traits of populations over generations. So here's, here's an example. Imagine this is a population. The yellow ones are elephants with tusks, let's say, and this, it, the numbers aren't exactly right, but just imagine that. And these, these red ones are the ones without tusks. Well, because of poaching, the ones with tusks get killed, leaving only the, the ones without tusks to survive and reproduce. And they pass on their traits to the population, and it, it's changed its traits. The frequency of tusklessness increases. So what we have is a population, and we have some traits the frequency of which change over generations. So those elephant populations in which tusklessness became more common evolved. And I want to emphasize this because that idea of evolution, although it's standard in biology, is unfamiliar to a lot of people outside biology who think of evolution as the creation of new species under natural selection over millions of years. And that is evolution. Every time new species have arisen over millions of years thanks to natural selection, that's evolution. But that's not all evolution is. Evolution is any change in the frequency of inherited traits of populations. So you don't have to create a new species to have evolution. And that's a really key idea in my talk. In this talk, I'm not talking about create, that people created new species. I'm talking about change of traits of populations without creating new species, so short of creating new species. Now, some important aspects of this. Number one, any degree of change counts as evolution. So if the population tusk of, uh, frequency of tusks change, that's evolution, even if you don't have new species. But also, any cause can create evolution. People are just as eligible as nature. You don't have to have natural selection to have evolution. It also only takes two generations. It doesn't take millions of years. And, um, the change can be inherited any way. Genetic inheritance counts, but there also are other ways for traits to be inherited. I'll return to that idea. Before I leave this slide, anybody have any questions? Does everybody feel comfortable with this concept of evolution? Yep, great, okay. Now, so coevolution is one type of evolution in which you have reciprocal changes between two populations. So with the elephants, I showed you the impact of one species on another, one population on another, people on elephants. But uh, what happened over time is that when you change one species, when one population changes another, those changes circle back. So this is actually the same uh, 
flow chart that I showed you for environmental history, but now it's about coevolution. So we, here we have elephants having certain traits. They affected people who then affected elephants. And in this case, we had elephants, and their trait was that they were almost all of them tusked. Uh, people looked at tusks and realized, boy, this is a really uh, almost magical substance. It's, it's quite hard, but also carvable. We can create sculptures out of it. We can create piano keys. We can create billiard balls. So people looked at the elephants and adopted some new behaviors and some new cultures of creating art out of tusks. So that changed the traits of people. They started behaving in a new way. Now, uh, and then once people were behaving in a new way, they started uh, killing more, more tusked elephants. The tuskless survived to reproduce, and tusklessness became more common. Um, so what we had is elephant traits affected people in a certain way, and this new behavior in people circled back to affect elephants. So that's coevolution. Now one um, concept that's important here is that behaviors are traits. People here weren't changing genetically. They were changing behaviorally. They learned some new ways of behaving. Um, when we think about biological traits, we often think about physical traits, and of course those are traits, but not all traits are physical. They're also behaviors. Uh, for some of them are uh, essential for life. For example, the beating of a heart, that's a behavior. Peristalsis is a behavior. Uh, my standing here is a behavior, of course, too. So uh, if behaviors become more or less frequent in a population, that's also evolution, because it fits that definition of change in inherited traits. And those, in the case of people, the behaviors we tend to pay attention to are usually the ones that are inherited not by genes, but by culture. So you can change very quickly, uh, even in, within a single person's lifetime. OK, so one of my arguments then about coevolutionary history is that to understand why elephants are changing, we cannot stay just within one discipline's bounds. We need to bring together the strengths of both biology and history to understand it. So here's an example. Uh, the question, of course, was uh, what history can do here is help answer the question of why is there poaching? That's not really a biological question. It it's, has to do with social motives uh, for people. And the answers are that you've got an art tradition. You have trades that link the areas where uh, African elephants live with tusks, with distant areas that create a market for that art. Uh, you have a lot of poverty in Africa in the area where these elephants live, which creates a very strong incentive to poach as one of the few ways to make a living to feed your family. And you have weak states who either lack the, the desire or the capacity to enforce poaching or anti-poaching laws. So this is a case where historians can bring to bear our skills and explain why poaching existed. Uh, biology itself is not really set up to analyze art, trade, poverty, and state capacity. But on the other hand, biology is really well equipped to, to help explain why the traits of these populations change in a way that history is not set up to do. So um, in classic evolutionary theory, you have uh, variation in traits in a population. Some of those traits confer an advantage in reproduction and sur survival in reproduction, which we call selection. Uh, those traits are inherited by genes or culture and the frequency changes. There are other mechanisms that I'm not going to go into now, such as drift, that can affect it as well. My point here is that if we want to understand why elephants used to look like that and now more often look like that, we can't answer that question from within either of these disciplines by itself. Only by putting them together can we explain why the frequency changed. We have to bring in together, together both the social analysis and the biological analysis. And that's what I mean by, by evolutionary history. It's the, the uh, field of history that brings together the approach of science and history to understand how traits of populations have changed over time. So to a great extent, my work is about trying to uh, work at the intersection of disciplines in a way that helps us understand processes in a way that disciplines by themselves uh, cannot do uh, very well. And so here's a, a, a framework for it. Uh, history is largely good, is good at talking about social change. 
uh, evolutionary ecology or biology is good at talking about change in organisms. And the place where they come together is uh, evolutionary or coevolutionary history. So that's the concept of an approach to understanding history. I'll pause here if there are any questions about this. OK. So now let's go. I'm going to go next. Uh, I've, I've done both of these, environmental history and coevolutionary history. Now I want to spend the, most, the majority of my time explaining my thesis, which is this, this process which I just explained of coevolution has been both common and important in history. Now this is a process that historians have not traditionally studied, uh, but in fact most of history has depended on it. Let me explain that argument. I want to look at four different aspects of history and show how, how coevolution has been common and important in all of them. The first part I want to talk about is agriculture. This is a wheat field in Kansas where I, where I work. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about public health. This is a stamp the United States put out as part of the worldwide malaria eradication project in the 1960s. Um, third, I want to talk about the Industrial Revolution. And then fourth, I want to talk about uh, recreation and dogs in Britain. So I'll, I'll look at these each in turn. So let's begin with agriculture. So this is a wheat field uh, in Kansas. Wheat, of course, is one of the most important domestic crops in the world, uh, along with potatoes and rice and maize. Um, and it uh, has been around for roughly 12,000 years. Um, and the, uh, the transition from people living as hunter-gatherers who relied on wild plants and animals for their food to being farmers who relied on domestic plants and animals is called the agricultural revolution. It actually took thousands of years to, to happen, so it was not revolutionary in pace. It was revolutionary in effect. Out of the agricultural revolution, uh, well, back up, uh, the agricultural revolution depended on domesticating wild plants and animals, which meant changing the traits of wild plants and animals to grow in human uh, captivity. Uh, so, so it was evolution. You had to take these wild plants and animals and modify their traits to make them suited. Uh, the first, who knows the first domesticated animal? Because this is a good example of how the traits get changed. Does anybody know? Yes, sir. Uh, excellent guess. It, it doesn't have to be correct, but that was a, you were on the right track. Yes. Dogs. Dogs, absolutely. And what animal was domesticated to create dogs? Wolves, exactly. So dogs and wolves are very different creatures, uh, but the, the, they, they're actually the same species. Um, they are, it's uh, uh, Canis lupus is the species. Canis lupus lupus is wild wolves. Canis lupus familiaris is dogs. So that's a good example of taking the traits of a wild species, making them different in a way that makes them uh, capable of living among people and doing services, providing services for people. Um, now, in order for, for domestication to occur, though, we had to change not just the traits of those animals, but also the traits of people. People had to learn to uh, feed, take care of um, animals, plant, harvest, replant uh, domestic uh, crops. So, so the human behaviors had to change. We had to be domesticated, too, in order for agriculture to work. Um, now, this is, this is huge in human history because the agricultural revolution is the reason that we have everything historians study. Historians traditionally have started their study with the, the invention of, of cities and writing. Uh, the idea was that writing was the beginning of history. Anything before that was considered prehistory or prehistoric. Um, but writing was a byproduct of the agricultural revolution. Hunter-gatherers have not developed writing systems. Uh, but once you have a settled society, you have, start having the accumulation of more goods, you start having more trade, it becomes more important to re be able to record information and also to move it to distant places. So you had the ability to feed scribes who developed writing systems. And out of that uh, sprang these complex, well, sprang the written records that historians use, but also settled society, cities, uh, empires, nations, all those things that historians study. They're a byproduct of agriculture. Hunter-gatherers don't create uh, cities, nation states, empires, uh, 
um, writing systems, the Federal Reserve, Kabuki Theater, and so on that historians study. So really, the agricultural revolution was the most important revolution in history, and all of recorded history is a byproduct of it. So this is one of my arguments that um, coevolution was, was essential for creating history. Now, it didn't stop. One of the problems with the way that people usually talk about domestication is that it's often portrayed as a one-time event. Oh, people domesticated dog, the wolves to create dogs, as though that was the end of the process. But you know, we have all these breeds. All those breeds didn't come into uh, being the first time wolves were domesticated. There was continual change after domestication, and that's huge. In fact, the reason that we can uh, be here all today is because continued coevolution in agricultural systems fe has fed the world. Uh, so this is a, a photo of rice farmers in the Philippines. Plant breeding and other agricultural practices have le has led to an increase in agricultural production, which enables uh, agriculture to feed ever more food. Um, now, one of the uh, venues where you see uh, um, this uh, a coevolutionary process within agriculture has to do with pests and pesticides. And since this, this uh, talk a ser is part of a series on sustainability, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this than I, I might on, on other occasions. The reason I picked a photo of rice farmers in the Philippines is because um, that's the origin of my scholarly career <laughs> and the topics that I'm interested in. Right after college, I went to the Philippines to work as a volunteer for a couple years in a rural development institute. So I saw this every day. And um, so I was working with rice farmers. And one of the things that uh, appalled me was the rate at which they, they and their children were dying because of pesticide poisoning, usually accidental, <clears throat> occasionally perhaps suicides, but mostly it was accidental. Uh, one of the images that sticks most clearly in my mind was going to buy uh, rice one time in a store and seeing sacks of rice, burlap sacks of rice, uh, and on top of it was a, a five-gallon container of pesticide. I thought, oh my goodness, if that leaks, it goes right into the rice and people take it home and eat it and perhaps uh, will die. So it was, it was this experience of seeing the, the health consequences of pesticides that got me interested in sustainable agriculture, so tying into the theme of this series. And one of the aspects that I got particularly interested in was the way in which pesticides were always failing. I don't know how many of you know this, but there's yet to be a pesticide invented that lasted for decades. Uh, it can still be produced. The, the chemical structure remains the same, but it loses its ability to kill pests. Why might that be? Yes, sir. Exactly. And explain, you're dead on right. So it, let's pull that apart. How would they evolve resistance over time? The ones that weren't, the ones that weren't resistant to the pesticides at birth would die off. Yep. And what they could do with our generations later. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect summary. So the, the resistant ones just happen to be resistant because of genetic variation, survive to reproduce. Uh, so actually, I went to graduate school in biology because I was interested in sustainable agriculture. I wanted to study ecological theory to try to develop a more sustainable method of agriculture. And then once I was doing that, I started getting in the roots of unsustainable agriculture. And I wrote a, uh, did my research on the history of pesticides. I found out that they, uh, I was wondering why this method of controlling pests that always, that was unsustainable. You know, the, the pesticides always lost their ability to kill pests. Why did we get on that treadmill? Why were we killing them that way instead of some other way? And uh, what I found was a lot of it was because of chemical warfare, that that had driven a lot of the development of, of insecticides. Um, so anyway, this is an example of coevolution in history. The reason pesticides continue to work is not because any one pesticide continues to work. It's because we're in a coevolutionary arms race with, in, with insects. We introduce a new insecticide. It works for a while. It loses the ability because the pests develop resistance. We introduce another one, and it works for a while. Resistance evolves, and so on. So it's this endless cycle that we're in, and it works only because we keep introducing new pesticides. It's not a sustainable system on a chemical uh, if we had just one pesticide. It's, it's sustainable so long as we can stay one step ahead of, of the insects. 
um, so we're in this coevolutionary arms race uh, in which we, between new, pests, or, uh, new pesticides and resistant pests. Okay, so my argument then about the commonness and importance of coevolution in agriculture is that it's central to all of human history. Uh, it's a byproduct of that coevolution that resulted in domestication of species. Continued coevolution is re the reason uh, that crop yields could go up and the reason we now have about 7 billion people instead of the 1 billion we had just a couple hundred years ago. So all that history that, that, of, um, uh, that 6 billion people have <laughs> are creating is thanks to this continued coevolution in agriculture that feeds all of us. So that's agriculture. Next I want to go to public health. And as I mentioned, this is a United States stamp. Uh, thanks largely to technological developments and institutional developments in World War II, uh, the United States and other countries developed a confidence that we could defeat malaria uh, after World War II. And so a global effort to eradicate malaria was launched. Um, before I go to that, though, I want to talk about another health aspect, which is antibiotics. We just talked about how insect pests evolve resistance to pesticides. The analogous process is uh, happening with antibiotics. That is, pathogens also are killed by a new antibiotic for a while, and then they evolve resistance to the poison. We introduce another new antibiotic. It works for a while, and so on. Um, now, uh, again, we're on, in a coevolutionary arms race with pathogens, and it's sustainable so long as we keep finding new antibiotics. But if, if we can't do that anymore, we're, we're at the end of the road, and it's not sustainable. Now, this is, this is a big deal. Uh, about 2 million people a year in the United States alone are uh, infected with pathogens that are resistant to antibiotics and about 23,000 people a year die because of this resistance. And this really hit home for me. I, I published uh, some of the information you're hearing today in a book called Evolutionary History. And I was writing about this uh, in my office at home one day, and then suddenly I remembered something that, that this information explained. When I was 13, my grandfather died. He, he went into the hospital for a, a prostate infection he had surgery, uh, then he got an infection. It sent his fever soaring. Uh, that overtaxed his heart. He had a heart attack and died. And at the time, I was really puzzled. Why would an infection kill my grandfather in the hospital? Uh, my sister used to get tonsillitis all the time. She would get penicillin. It would cure her. Uh, I mean, I was used to antibiotics working. And if he was in the hospital, they surely had all the antibiotics you could want in a hospital. So that seems like the last place somebody would die of an infection. Um, but I was 13, and there are a lot of mysteries in life. I put it on that metal shelf that's long and dark in your memory of things you, you, do, you can't figure out at the time, and you largely forget about it until something comes back. And then when I was writing about this process one day, I realized, oh, that's what happened. He was almost surely treated with an antibiotic that used to be effective, against the pathogen he acquired in the hospital. But the pathogen had evolved resistance. So that's why it was able to run wild through his body, cause this high fever as a response, which overtaxed his heart and killed him. Um, so it, he was one of these people, I, I think, um, that, that died because of this, this evolutionary process. So these are matters of life and death. These aren't just trivial sorts of processes. These, these things, uh, if by producing more food, coevolution benefits a lot of people. By killing people, coevolu evolu well, evolution in, in uh, pathogens uh, causes people to die. Uh, something similar or parallel happened within the effort to eradicate malaria from Earth. Um, DDT was an insecticide that was uh, actually invented in the 19th century, but was only developed in World War II as a way to kill insect-borne, uh, well, to kill insects that carry diseases. The two main diseases of concern were typhus, which is carried by lice, and malaria, which is carried by mosquitoes. So during World War I, um, 
about three million people died uh, on the Eastern Front, both because of World War I and the, and the subsequent Russian Revolution. So the United States and Britain knew going into World War II that typhus could kill, kill millions of people during the war, and they were very concerned about that. And they were looking, they decided to launch some research to find a way to prevent that from happening. And they started researching insecticides to kill the lice that carried the, the typhus pathogen and um, ended up testing DDT. Those are the three initials for a long chemical name. Um, and it worked really well at killing lice. And then they, the other concern was malaria, which was partly a concern in, in uh, southern Europe, such as Italy. It was a problem in northern Africa, which also had battles. But for the US, the really big threat from malaria was in the Pacific. Uh, at the beginning of the war, the US Army didn't worry much about malaria and paid the price. At the beginning of World War II, malaria was knocking out eight to 10 times more American soldiers than the Japanese Army was. Uh, because the Army commanders were worried about fighting Japanese soldiers instead of malaria, they were losing 90% of their men to disease when they actually didn't have to. So uh, there were, they, they started, you can stop the transmission of malaria in a number of ways, and they launched many of them. DDT made it easier and faster and cheaper to do, and it, it sent the, the malaria rate uh, plummeting so that it was um, actually uh, uh, about the same in the Pacific that it was inside the US, which was quite low. So the, the invention of DDT helped raise uh, hopes that it might be possible to stamp out malaria worldwide. It wasn't just uh, DDT. Also, there was the development of um, drugs, the anti-malarial drugs that you could take to kill the pathogen inside the body. So the hope was between these two poisons, uh, the anti-malaria drugs that would kill the pathogen and the insecticide that would kill the mosquitoes. You could break the transmission and wipe the scourge off the earth. Um, so a worldwide malaria eradication project was launched, and at first it was hugely successful. It saved an estimated 25 million lives. So that's big. That's, that's a great success. But both the pathogen and the mosquitoes evolved resistance to their poisons. And um, for a time, there was an effort to substitute new ones, but it was failing. And then finally, the project was just given up. And now today, about 2 million people around the world die of malaria. And if insects and pathogens did not evolve, they would be alive today, all these people. They'd be alive. It's because of the evolution of resistance that we have millions of people dying today. So when I say this is a common and important process, we can document that in the number of people who are alive and dead. So coevolution in public health, actually the evolution has been responsible for deaths of millions. Um, any questions about these two, agriculture and health, food and health? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, especially with um, that, well, let's see. Um, I'm actually less familiar with the, the plasmodium's evolution. I'm uh, more familiar with the idea that agriculture changed the environment in a way that uh, helped mosquitoes and thus helped the spread of it. And that, in turn, created the selective pressures that led to human evolution um, with genetic traits that confirmed, conferred some resistance. Can you tell me about the plasmodia well, evolution yeah, itself? OK. Some, some that, uh, the coevolution is in that. That'd, I'd like to find out about that. That'd be great. Thanks. Yes, sir. Right, um, exactly. Is, 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 is that, do they like gain a sense of bad later on if we stop using them? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Usually, yes. 
if you stop using them for long enough, uh, usually there's a, there's a trade-off. Often the, the ability to resist these insecticides comes at a, at a metabolic cost for the, let's say, the mosquito. And so if you take away the DDT, then um, those insects, those mosquitoes who have this detoxification machinery running all the time are at a disadvantage because you know, it doesn't help them to have it. It comes at a cost because they're using up energy they could have been devoting to something else. So if you, if you stop using the insecticide, uh, the population can revert to being resistant again. And actually, in, in Great Britain, they've, they've put this into effect in, in, in government policy. Uh, I spent a year at, at Cambridge uh, in sabbatical when my daughters were in, in grade school. So they went, went to school, and they came home with lice in their hair. Uh, and so we were told to go to the pharmacy to, to get lice medication. And uh, when we got there, we found out that they were on a rotation uh, all the pharmacies in the whole country sold the same one anti-lice insecticide. I mean, that's what these powders are. They're insecticides. The whole country had to, all the pharmacies had to sell the same one for a three-month period. And then they all had to switch to a different one, a second one for a three-month period. And then they all had to switch to a third one for a three-month period and, and so on to avoid building up resistance to one uh, one insecticide. So they, this was government policy responding uh, to that, and, and they were hoping that by the time you cycled back to that first one, the lice would be susceptible again to it. It's a great example of coevolution. You have people introducing the insecticide, the lice evolve resistance, the people develop this, not just new behaviors as individuals, but the whole governmental structure, the state adopts new policies to try to manage the evolution. So it's a great co-evolutionary sequence. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, the second most important revolution in history, the Industrial Revolution. So um, brief, the Industrial Revolution is a, a huge topic, and um, I'm going to uh, condense it to, to one slide, even though there, you find whole shelves and shelves and shelves of the library have books on it. Um, and of course, people have questioned many aspects of it, but the classic view is that it, it occurred uh, between the first Industrial Revolution, sometimes people call it, between about 1760 and 1830, so you know, the few decades on, on either side of 1800, that it first developed in England, and it, that it marked a, a transition in the economy from being based primarily on agriculture to being based primarily on industry and services. So that's the Industrial Revolution. You can think of it basically as a shift from agriculture to industry as the economic basis, meaning both uh, where the, the economic value comes, but also where people are employed. If most people are employed in agriculture, that's an agricultural society. If they mostly work for manufacturing and service industries, that's an industrial economy. So it's huge because Imagine how different it is to live on a farm versus a city. It remade people's lives, led to fast economic growth, uh, which had many consequences as well. So hugely important. Now, um, cotton spinning has long been regarded as one of the leading edges of the Industrial Revolution. Um, in fact, early research used to claim that it caused the Industrial Revolution. People don't really agree that anymore, but they agree that it was one of the leading edges. And I remember being surprised, cotton, you know, I mean, t-shirts, industrial revolution, how could t-shirts be so important? Well, the reason is because cotton was the uh, place where um, a lot of hand processes were replaced by machinery, basically hand spinning and weaving was replaced by machinery. So the idea of substituting machines for human labor was highly developed there. And, and this was a key part, those machines were concentrated into single buildings to become factories. So the factory system uh, was pioneered in cotton. Now, as historians have looked, like this always happens in, once historians look at something, you find earlier antecedents. But for our purposes, this is, uh, this is you know, rough, the rough picture is accurate enough. So this is an image of an early cotton spinning factory. Uh, these are women tending these uh, machines that are processing the cotton. 
if you've, any of you have visited historic uh, mach uh, machine shops, you've seen something like this. There's a, a, a rod here that turns and rotates. It turns these wheels, and there are belts that come down here to turn the machines. Uh, so actually, in the early days, a lot of these were powered on, on water, uh, like uh, uh, water wheels would be connected to these. And turning them later, coal became the dominant fuel. Um, so in some ways, I mean, I, I like pointing this out, how similar that is in concept to the turn spit and the way of turning meat. You know, you got this, this wheel up above, got a, a belt that transfers the, the, the rotational motion to another uh, device and it turns it. So um, let's talk first of all about why historians have said that the English mechanized cotton spinning. Now, I'll just mention here in 1764, there was the invention of something called the spinning jenny, which is still seen as, as a, a breakthrough invention uh, because it mechanized some of the spinning processes. You can see that this one woman is controlling a machine that it's hard to tell. These are bobbins. So she's spinning a lot of bobbins at the same time. And that was really the big advantage of machine spinning. One person could control spinning of many threads at the same time. That was, that was the, the big efficiency and labor saving. Um, and usually, if you look at the historical literature, this is credited to a couple things. One is the genius of English inventors. They were seen, they're seen as unusually uh, practical and, and uh, capable. Um, and there's also this claim in the literature that the uniformity of cotton made it easy to spin. Okay, so that's what other researchers have, have largely said. Um, I ended up concluding something else, uh, thanks to research. What I, what I decided was that these English inventors uh, were actually responding to an opportunity created for them by uh, Amerindians in the New World uh, who created cotton with extra long fibers. And that created this, it, it was a necessary step, but not sufficient for mechanizing. I, I'm giving you the big picture. I need to go back now and fill in the intermediate steps. So I know I haven't told you the whole story, but that's what I'm saying is American Indians created long fiber cotton. That was essential for mechanizing cotton spinning. Okay? Uh, so now let's talk about it. So um, prior to the 18th century, England got almost all of its cotton from the Old World. There are two domestic Old World species of cotton. They grew largely in the Mediterranean uh, and uh, Eastern Mediterranean, but also in South Asia, what's now India and Pakistan and um, area. So these are bowls of Old World cotton, and they have fibers of, say, about a centimeter in length. So this was, this was what pretty much all of the cotton imports to England looked like until the mid, uh, well, until the 18th century. And uh, people could spin this by hand, um, but the thread was pretty weak. Mainly what the English used this for was stuffing and for making candle wicks. Now, those were the major uh, consumption areas. Now, in the 18th century, England suddenly started importing cotton in quantity from the West Indies, the Caribbean. And there are, in the New World, there were two other species of domesticated cotton, different from the two Old World species. And the New World species had much longer fibers than the Old World species. Um, one of those species is called Gossypium barbadense, uh, and this is the one that actually was what started surging into England in the 18th century. So you compare the length of these fibers with the length of these fibers, two to three times longer. And that's going to be crucial to the story. Uh, th this, is, this is the variety that I'm arguing spawn mechanization of cotton spinning. Um, this, not just variety, but species. This is a separate species called Gossypium hirsutum, which was not important in the early uh, mechanization of cotton spinning, but it came, became hugely important. This one has intermediate fiber length between the super long barbadense and the short old world cottons. Um, this is the species that 
originated, it, this one originated in Mexico and became the dominant species in the American South, including in Virginia. Uh, and this is the, when, we, when you think about American cotton, the vast majority was this species. Um, in the US, we call this species Sea Island cotton. Okay, it's also known as Egyptian cotton. That's a transplant from um, the New World to the Old World. Uh, it's also called Pima cotton um, in the Southwest. It was an adaptation of this to the, the Southwest. Uh, this is um, the, the main cotton grown across the South. And the intermediate length was, was good enough for machine spinning too. Now this uh, long fiber was not a gift of nature by itself. Uh, archaeological evidence indicates that the fibers of new, all the cottons, New World and Old World, originally were very short. And they were probably collected mainly for stuffing, things like mattresses as well, for clothing, for warmth. But if you think about it, if you're out there uh, picking cotton, where are you going to concentrate your energy, you get your, uh, your time? You get the highest return per minute if you pick the big bowls, right, with the long fibers. Um, kind of like if you're picking berries, you often will focus on the big ones instead of the tiny ones because that gives you a higher payoff. And then you take those home, you use them in your mattress till it wears out, you dump them out in the trash near your house, and then the next year when you go to, or two years later, three years later, you go to pick the cotton, you're first going to go to the plants near your house, you're going to pick the biggest ones, and if you do that enough times, you're going to gradually lengthen the fiber length, even if you're not, even if you are not intending to do so. And that's what it looks like happened. By the time Columbus arrived, he was amazed at New World Cotton. And now he was a sailor. So you might think, well, why would a sailor pay attention to cotton traits? But think about it, this is in the age of sails. So the quality of fiber, of thread, was essential for being a successful sailor. And he, he said, these Indians have got uh, cotton, yarn, and cloth of a quality that's just almost unbelievable. So the, new, the Indians in the New World had um, lengthened this so much that they were making uh, fishnets out of it, lines, and, and weaving it into cloth as well. Okay, now here's the pattern of imports of New World cotton into, well, cotton in general, into Britain in the 18th century. So this goes from 1700 to 1780, um, and there are two main things to look at. One is this is the imports of Old World cottons, mainly from Eastern Mediterranean, and um, actually at that time it was almost all from the Eastern Mediterranean. Later, more came from India, but at this time, India was not exporting to Britain. Uh, and this is New World cotton, almost all from the West Indies. Later, more would come from Brazil and the US and that sort of thing. But at this time, it was almost all from the West Indies. And the important thing to note is that um, there is a, a sharp decline in Old World cottons and a big surge here in the, in the mid-18th century. And this is actually when those new cotton machines were invented. And in fact, they were invented in the place where this New World cotton concentrated. If, if you think about that argument that English inventors were brilliant, and that's the reason you got new inventions, uh, there's a problem. All of the inventions originated in one county in northwestern England. Uh, if, the, if it was this kingdom-wide creativity, you would expect them to arise, arise in multiple places. And especially you might have thought, it were, it were, if you say, well, you know, if you have cotton around, it's important. Um, London would be a good candidate because most of this old world cotton was going into London. London invented none of the new machines. All of the machines were invented in the Northwest where the, the new world cotton was arriving, Lancashire. Uh, and so these were some of the new machines uh, that were spinning uh, cotton. And here's the key idea that, that pulls together the, the thread length, I mean the fiber length, and why you could mechanize. And this is where you know, whole industries rest on very small differences in, in traits. The longer the fiber of cotton, the stronger the thread. Okay? So the difference in thread strength between the new world and the old world cottons was about uh, seven times. And that's crucial if you're building a cotton factory 
where you're trying to spin 20 uh, bobbins, 20 threads at the same time. Because when a, if a thread broke, you had to shut down the machine and tie it back together by hand and then start your machine again. Every time you shut down your machine, you lose all your advantages of production. You go from producing 20 at the same time to zero. So machine spinning required thread strong enough not to break despite the rigors of machine spinning. So that was the key thing. Uh, in fact, I mentioned that, that you could hand spin old world fiber into, into thread. It was so weak they could use it to make the, the weft, which is the, the thread that goes sideways when you're weaving, but it was too weak to make uh, the warp, which are the ones that get stretched. Um, the English could not make all cotton cloth until they got the New World ones. Um, now, the evidence for this, the new factory, the new machinery in England used only New World cotton. They used only New World cotton, even though it cost far more than Old World cotton. And there, was, there were bags of Old World cotton sitting unsold on the docks. Now, these early factory owners and inventors were not in the cotton industry as public service. <laughs> these, were, these were the capitalists that Marx and Engels wrote about. Uh, Engels, in fact, was in the cotton trade. Uh, they were profit maximizers. If they had been able to use cheap, short fiber old world cotton, they would have. They used new world cotton because they had to, even though they were paying two and three times more for new world cotton than old world cotton. Uh, old world cotton they, they used as filling to add fluff but their machines had to have the New World cotton. And they, they began by using that Barbadense, which was the one I showed you over here that was extra long. The, the medium length hirsutum was long enough as well, but the Old World uh, could only be used as, as filling, not as the main thread, because it was too weak. Okay, so uh, my argument is that the coevolution between cotton and Amerindians in North America created an opportunity for English inventors to invent new machines. All right, now I want to move to recreation. So this is serious stuff. Food, life, industry, let's have some fun. Um, so I want to talk about dogs and gamblers in England to show how even in daily, ordinary life, coevolution has been really important. This is an image of bull baiting in 1825 in England. Uh, bull baiting was a sport that involved sending dogs to rush at and attack another, uh, an animal. Baiting means doing it with any animal. Bull baiting means you send them against a bull. So the, this dog is rushing at the bull. This, uh, the bulls would defend themselves by lowering their heads to the ground, waiting for the dog to rush in, then lifting their head up and flinging the dog into the air. This man right here is catching a dog that has been flung up into the air by this, these bull's horns, and he's trying to catch him to keep it from being hurt. So that's bull baiting. Um, now, mastiffs originally were used in bull baiting. In fact, it was required by law because the belief was that it would tenderize the meat if you um, had, a, had a mastiff bait the bull. Uh, and they would, they would rush at the bull, and gamblers developed a rule, which is they would put two mastiffs and see which one ran at the bull more times. And then would, uh, you, gamblers would bet on the two dog, one or the other of the dogs, and the, the dog that ran more often would, would be the winner, and thus the person would win the bet. But then one day a dog showed a new trait, uh, not trained to do it, but one dog grabbed, seized the bull's face and held on, uh, which turned out to immobilize the bull. It's really painful to have a dog hang from your nose by its teeth. So the bull would lower his head to the ground and stop moving. Uh, and so uh, gamblers thought, wow, that's pretty neat. We could convert this contest from dog versus dog to dog versus bull. And we can say that if the dog p immobilizes or pins the bull, the dog wins. Uh, if the bull manages to fight off the dog, the bull wins. And so they developed new gambling rules and said, let's have it be dog versus bull. So this is the origin of bulldogs. So now you know where bulldogs came from. They were the dogs that had this trait of seizing and holding uh, onto uh, bulls' faces. So it's, you have coevolution. You have, you have dogs, mastiffs, which are big dogs, that would run back and forth but not try to seize them. 
That led to certain uh, behavioral traits in people, certain gambling rules. A dog originated a new trait, which was seizing and holding and pinning. People developed new gambling rules to do that, and they bred bulldogs to have the traits to maximize their chance of winning bets. So it's a coevolutionary sequence. It ended, at least on a legal basis, in 1835 when, when Parliament banned uh, bull baiting. Um, now, there was another sport, too, dog fighting, which originated uh, thanks to urbanization in Britain in the 19th century. And bull baits, had, they, they required a fair amount of space. Uh, the bulls were usually attached to a wall or a, a stake by rope, but still it took a lot of space and it could take a lot of time. In cities, people wanted to be able to do this, uh, to have a, a, a blood sport involving dogs. that They could do at night in a small space indoors, and they invented dog fighting to do it. So what dog fighting involved was having two dogs uh, fight at, against each other. This too is an image from England from 1825 small indoor space in the evening. Uh, the space was uh, an area of ground, probably a, you know, about like if we take this um, surface, table, whatever you call that, and imagine this area is enclosed uh, with this fence that you see around the side. Uh, that was called a pit. So the, the dogs would fight in a pit, and they would uh, gamble on which dog would fail to come up to scratch, which meant uh, running across from one side at the other dog. And so the key to win this task was to immobile, not just, the key was to try to immobilize the other dog. And to do that, uh, bulldogs, which is what they used at first, were suboptimal, because the bulldogs would just grab and hold, but that would not kill the other dog. Uh, or damage it so much it couldn't fight. So they crossed, they decided to come up, create a new type of dog that would be better at, immobile, at, at uh, damaging or killing the other dogs. So they crossed bulldogs with um, terriers, which were dogs bred to go into the ground and get vermin and kill them by shaking back and forth. So terriers were used to killing their prey, not just holding them. And, uh, so they crossed them and came up with this bulldog terrier cross, which they called bull terriers, uh, which are also known as pit bull terriers, which are also known as pit bulls. So now you know where that name came from because of the pits in which the fights were taking place. Uh, this is actually one of the very first, uh, this, this right here is one of the very first pit bull terriers uh, ever bred. This is one of its uh, parents right here, and, and that's its offspring from 1822. Now, so you have in the, in the blood sports, you had the development of two different kinds of dogs uh, because people wanted to gamble on contests. There also was, was hunting, and greyhounds were, were bred to hunt many kinds of animals. By the 19th century, it was, mainly just, it was really just hares that they were pursuing, and men would follow on a horseback. Uh, and there were class-based limits on ownership of uh, greyhounds. You had to be an aristocrat. Only 1% of the population could legally own greyhounds. Uh, there was a lot of variation in greyhounds because the landscape varied. Long hair was better than short hair because in, in, in brushy areas because it would protect you from cuts. Um, and so that some, some greyhounds had rough coats, some had smooth coats and that sort of thing. Um, there was a different way of using it besides hunting called match coursing, which also was about gambling. A lot of dog breeding in Eng England was motivated by gambling. Um, and the way that would work is they would send two greyhounds after the hare. The simple rule would be whichever greyhound killed the hare first would be the winner, but that was too quick for them. So they developed these complex rules where the dog that caused the hare to turn more times was the winner. Um, and so what happened was you had a divergence in greyhound populations between the ones that were used in hunting, which went out and tried to kill the hare right away, versus the ones that were used in, in match coursing, uh, which would try to turn them right away. And so they were separate populations. And then in, in the uh, late 19th century, you got a new job for greyhounds, which was competing in shows, which had nothing to do with the traits valued here. Here the valued traits were behaviors, and here the valued traits was appearance. Uh, which was the most beautiful greyhound. 
And um, the original show dogs were uh, coursing greyhounds, the, the match coursing greyhounds, but then those populations diverged also. The best coursing dogs tended not to win shows and vice versa. So you ended up actually with three different jobs for greyhounds in the 19th century and three different populations as well. Uh, but workers couldn't keep greyhounds. They didn't have access to these big estates and it was illegal before 1831 to own them. So they developed their own dogs uh, that would enable them to gamble. And that was whippets, which were developed in the 19th century by members of the working class, mainly in northern England. Uh, and at first they started out coursing rabbits. It was illegal for ordinary people to possess a hare before 1831, but rabbits were in a different category and they could. So they, had, they used whippets, which are small versions of greyhounds, to catch rabbits and they bet on them the same way aristocrats did on greyhounds and hare coursing. Um, and then they developed racing. This was actually the first dog racing. They used straight tracks, like the 100 meter tracks in the Olympics that people run on. They look like that. That's what this is right here. You have uh, a finish line here. You have a judge right here looking down the finish line to see which dog finishes first. You have spectators here. So they were gambling on dog racing. Uh, greyhound racing was a 20, 20th century development. So whippets and whippet racing came first. Uh, and then whippets went into shows as well and also became a different separate population. So in sum, the food we eat, the health we enjoy or do not enjoy, the way in which we make a living, and even the way in which we recreate has had enormous fundamental impact on human lives uh, throughout the world through, through most of time. So going back here and looking at this, this uh, vignette from Wales, we can see that, that having the dog here is completely integrated in this life. It's easy to overlook him and take him for granted, but so much of history depends on understanding how and why it was shaped to do this kind of work and how its ability to do that kind of work shaped the lives of human experience. And that applies to so many more species than we have dreamed. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, since this is being filmed, if you raise your hand, uh, Dr. Rader or myself will run over and give you the microphone. And if you would please ask your question into the microphone. Uh, and then um, we will try to answer it for you. So if there's any questions. Which species, again, was the Egyptian cotton? Uh, Gossypium barbadense. The question was, uh, the which species one. was um, Egyptian cotton? So it, it was the longest fibered one, right? Thank you. And, the, and it, so it's called Egyptian because it grows in Egypt, but it was a species that originated in the New World and was transplanted to Egypt. But it was the arrival of that one that created the Egyptian cotton industry. Mm -hmm. And they, they originated it to feed the factories in England. They, it was designed in Egypt as an export crop from the beginning. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you mentioned the DDT resistant mosquitoes were actually less fit in other conditions due to their physiology. I was wondering if um, that trade-off exists for a lot of the other um, co-evolutionary um, changes that you mentioned. It does. That's an, that's an excellent point. There, um, evolution is about trade-offs in many ways. There, there are almost always a trade-off between one thing for another. And what, what's really important is, is that a set of traits that's, that's advantageous in one environment is disadvantageous in another. So you don't have universally superior genetic makeup. Uh, it, one genome is better in one environment, another genome is better in another environment, that sort of thing. So those, those trade-offs are common. Uh, if you look at, at the dogs, for example, um, the behavior that would keep a dog, literally keep a, dog, a greyhound alive when used in hunting, which was to run and kill the dog right away, would get the dog killed 
if it was owned by one of these people gambling in match coursing. If their dog ran and killed the hare right away, the owner would kill the dog right away because they would lose the, the, the bet that they had placed on it, and they didn't want that behavior. They wanted the dog that would turn it many times. So in, in almost all of these cases, there are trade-offs. And it, you're, on, you're on to really something really important because uh, breeders will often say we have improved the breed by doing one thing. And, it, and you've raised the key point, which is really what that means is they've made it better at doing one specific thing. It, they're not actually improved in any universal or general sense. They're just better in a specific environment. This is a question out of pure ignorance. Um, I, all of my knowledge of hunting basically comes from paintings. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering, um, with, say, foxhounds versus beagles, it's my understanding that, that, that beagles burrow, right, and that foxhounds are better runners and those sorts of things. So I'm wondering, um, did, did on aristocratic hunts, um, did people have packs of varieties of dogs to, uh, to basically you know, confront different tasks? Was that? No. Yeah, so the question is whether hunters had different kinds of dogs to do different tasks. And the answer is yes, absolutely. So foxhounds were bred to, produce, to uh, pursue foxes. And uh, beagle, uh, but the key thing is foxhounds were bred to pursue foxes while people followed them on horseback. Mm -hmm. So they had to be fairly fast. Be but, but foxhounds ran too fa fast for people on foot. Uh, and... Um, and ac actually, well, there were foxhounds and there were harriers, mm -hmm. uh, which were packs bred to chase hares, mm -hmm. um, and also by the 18th century, also on, on horseback. Uh, but they ran too far ahead of people who wanted to follow on foot, and that's where beagles came in. Beagles were designed to be slower versions of those hunting dogs so that you could follow on foot. Um, so, so if somebody had a beagle pack, you know that they were planning to follow running and what that usually meant was running across agricultural fields in the countryside you go through streams and fields and everything which gave rise to a sport called cross country running and one of my mysteries when i was for many years also was why cross country ran runners were called harriers uh, i never understood why, why harriers and it was when i was doing this project i realized oh it's because they were chasing hares originally uh, they were following the beagles, which were following the hares. But you have to go back through several steps of history before you understand why we, ha we call high school cross-country runners on a golf course harriers. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about the effects of the politics of DDT yeah. and how Silent Spring and Rachel Carson sort of tie into the development of the resistance by mosquitoes to DDT? Right, so great question. Um, what are the politics of DDT? Let me gather my thoughts because it's a big, it's actually a big question. Um, the political structure of the United States government in World War II kept DDT off the civilian market. First, because all of it was needed for the army, okay, to save soldiers from those insect-borne diseases. But also because the scientists who developed DDT for the army were worried about its impact on people and wildlife. They started doing tests during World War II on the impact of DDT on fish and game birds and uh, beneficial insects that prey on bad insects and that kind of thing, and they were getting alarming results. They were worried. So they said, uh, wartime is a special situation. Soldiers are facing life-threatening diseases, malaria and typhus, and they're going to be exposed to this dangerous-looking chemical for a short period of time, and they're not going to eat it, at least not intentionally. So we think it's worth using DDT to protect soldiers. But, and the, it, I was fascinated to find this. At the same time, they said a different calculation of costs and benefits holds in agriculture. 
Um, they said, we, we see this has great potential for agriculture, but we're worried. For one thing, people would eat this insecticide. Uh, it, you know, it, when you're spraying against mosquitoes, people are not eating it on purpose. But if you spray this insecticide on apple trees, people are going to eat the apples that will have the insecticide on it. That's number one. Number two, you're talking about lifetime exposure. Soldiers might be sprayed for a few months when they're in a dangerous area. But if you use it in agriculture, you could be talking 70, 80 years of a person's life. So it's long-term exposure. So ingesting it for decades uh, seemed really different. And the risks were much lower. They said, on, you know, a soldier could die because of typhus, but nobody's going to die if an apple has a worm in it. So we, we need to have a different cost, uh, calculation of costs and benefits. And they said, let's go slow. Let's do more research before we, re we release DDT for civilian use. But what's, and they could do that because of the warp, the, the unusual powers that the federal government claimed during wartime. The interesting, so they kept it off the civilian market. The interesting thing was that once the war ended, the federal government lost its emergency powers. And it reverted to pre-war regulatory systems. And the federal government did not at that time have the legal authority to keep an insecticide off the market. It had, it had the authority to require accurate labeling, but that was all. So the manufacturers suddenly started selling it as fast as possible. So the politics, the political structure of the United States and the difference between war powers and civilian powers was absolutely fundamental in, in converting DDT from a military product to a civilian product. So then during the 40s, 50s, it was seen largely as a miracle product, uh, but not quite as much as there was more questions about it than people knew. Rachel Carson was the famous author of the book Silent Spring, came out in 1962, which created a lot of, uh, raised the public awareness about dangers of pesticides, DDT being her major example. Now, Carson was aware of the dangers of DDT for fish and wildlife because during World War II, she was a writer for the Fish and Wildlife Service, which was doing the tests of DDT on the, on the fish and wildlife. So she knew about it all the way back in, in the 1940s. And then it seems not to have paid much attention until spraying became more common to stop mosquitoes in urban areas. And then she got concerned about that spraying effect on people and effect on birds and that kind of thing. And so Carson's contribution was to take concerns about the safety that had stayed in expert circles. There were discussions among experts, but the public didn't really know about them. They weren't reading those journals, scientific journals. Carson acted as a translator and took the scientific research from those specialist journals to the public and helped catalyze a public reappraisal that ended up have, helping to catalyze the environmental movement and catalyze changes in environmental laws, including pesticide laws. So the uh, legal and political structure in the United States at different periods had a big impact on uh, whether it was used and what quantities and to what extent the, the government could regulate it. Good question. One last question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. I have a mic, so. Um, so I'm sure you've heard of Big History, a, a sort of movement, a curricular movement that's funded by the Gates Foundation, sort of the idea of which is to form a curriculum that goes from Big Bang to the present. <laughs> um, a lot of what's driving that is a kind of uh, move towards interdisciplinary education to sort of, and Bill Gates himself talks about how I really wasn't that interested in history until I found Big History. <laughs> um, so is coevolutionary history a kind of big history? Do you think of it mm -hmm. that way? And um, if so, to what kind of implications that does that have for curriculum in both history and in science? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think you all heard, but it, is coevolutionary history a, a, a part of or a facet of, of big history? Um, yes, absolutely. Evolution is one of the most important processes in the world. And my argument here is to try to show how it has shaped some of the most important transitions in history. So big history also includes the period before life, you know, when the, where, from the Big Bang and that sort of thing. So it has nothing to say about that period. But once you have organisms, certainly then evolution is e essential to understand in order to understand the course of human history. And, and uh, 
to go to the big history theory, the, one of the major theorists is talking about th important thresholds in time. And one of those thresholds he identifies is the agricultural revolution. I think he has the industrial revolution as another threshold. So in many ways, we're arguing the same thing um, about the importance of those thresholds and the importance of anthropogenic evolution in creating those thresholds. So yeah, very, very much consistent. All right, let's thank uh, Ed Russell for his wonderful and stimulating thank talk. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. And again, uh, check out the uh, STS, VCU at STS website for upcoming events. The next one being November, Lisa Sedaris talking about uh, uh, environmental ethics. Uh, again, thanks for coming and hope to see you then.